There we go. We are now live. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to House Transportation Committee. It is Wednesday, May 19th, uh, 2021. We are here um, uh, graciously. Uh, uh, some members who have been a part of the Climate Council and others are here hopefully to give us an update. And we thank them so much because this is a very busy time. So before we go to the floor, this is a opportunity for us to, oh, um, it's not like official testimony, but it's for us to get a feel for where that's going because we know and we're looking forward with great anticipation of uh, good things that are gonna be coming out of that council um, before we're back in January. And we'd love to get a sneak preview about what's going on. So before we go to the floor, which by the way, our T-bill will be up this morning our committee of conference and then and then um, our work for uh, in, in the committee should be completed for the for this session. So with that, who would like to go first? We have Julie Hi. Moore from ANR and Johanna Miller from uh, VNRC and Jane, not going to get your last name. <laughs> Liz Archek, thank Liz you. Archek. Thank you to be with us as our guest. Is does anybody want to particularly want to go first? All right. Yeah. Julie, so please. I uh, good morning, everyone. For those who I don't know, uh, I'm Julie Moore. I'm the secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources, and thought I could give a, a brief sort of progress report on the work of the Climate Council. Um, and wanted to, to introduce Jane and Joey. Jane is the director of the Global Warming Solutions Act. So as you may recall. Uh, the General Assembly provided three positions to support the work necessary to develop the Climate Action Plan. Um, and, and Jane is, is the one we filled thus far, um, but the, the most important one and is really the, the person coordinating um, the work of the council, the steering committee, as well as the five subcommittees um, that where the, the, the um, technical work at this point is, is underway. Um, and then pleased that, that Joey Miller from BNRC, who is a council member, is able to join us this morning as well. Um, understanding the committee may have some transportation specific questions and that's an area where, where Joey has been focused. So, but thought I could take maybe 15 minutes and just provide a high level overview on the work of the council to date. Um, and then happy to sort of turn it into to more of a, a free form discussion and hope that between the three of us, we can answer any questions you might have. Do I have the ability to share my screen? You, you will. When, <clears throat> excuse me. When Lori can can make that happen. Okay, fantastic. You do now. All right, great. Um, okay. Oh, here we go. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. It's starting to come in. All right. There we go. Um, I'm going to be able to. Oh, here we go. Um, so just a, a little bit of, of where we've been um, before we get to where we're going. As you likely recall, uh, the General Assembly passed the Global Warming Solutions Act last September um, and then had 60 days to make appointments to the 23 member council. Um, that all of the appointments were received by mid-October, um, and then the administration had 30 days to convene our convene the first meeting of the council, which was held on November 20th. We did provide a very brief written report uh, to the General Assembly back in the middle of January that just sort of really described um, the efforts we were undergoing to, to organize ourselves. Um, and all of this is building towards adopting a climate action plan by December 1st of this year. Uh, as you may recall, the climate action plan has a number of, of fairly specific requirements that need to be integrated into the plan, um, including strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, efforts to encourage smart growth. We're charged with looking at uh, long-term sequestration and storage of carbon um, across our, our natural and working lands. Um, there's a requirement to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 across all sectors. Um, we pay particularized attention um, to some of the, the challenges faced by rural and marginalized communities. Uh, all, and all of this is intended to be done in, in looking of ways to reduce the use of chemicals and products that contribute to climate change. 
And then there's also a strong um, component around adaptation and resilience. Um, so overall, I think of our work as falling into three big buckets, the greenhouse gas emissions reduction bucket, the climate adaptation and resilience bucket, and the carbon sequestration bucket. And can talk a little bit more about that when we get to the subcommittees and how their work aligns with those. Uh, the full council has met eight times uh, since that first meeting on November 20th. Uh, we, we had several meetings a month early on, um, but have now gotten into a, a cadence where we're looking at meeting um, once a month because must, mo much of the substantive work at this point is actually taking place in the subcommittees. And it's really sort of the, the council's role is more plenary um, and focused on ensuring that the subcommittees are continuing to advance their work um, in a timely fashion that will allow all those pieces to come back together um, as part of the climate action plan. And then also really thinking about stakeholder engagement and outreach across the full breadth of the council's work. Uh, although it wasn't explicitly provided for in statute, we did end up creating a steering committee for the council that uh, has six members, myself and Secretary Young representing the executive branch. And then we have two um, of the legislatively appointed members by the House, two of the members that were legislatively appointed through the Senate uh, for a total of six. And, and our role is to meet more, a little bit more frequently. Um, we develop the, count, the council agenda meetings um, and then also have a role thinking about contractor support. And I'll talk a little bit about that piece in a moment on down the line. But you know that that box at the bottom really gets to the point of the steering committee, which is to, to organize the work of the council, but not control it. So in statute, uh, we were provided with four specific subcommittees, uh, rural resilience and adaptation. And, and we've broadened that to have uh, a statewide focus on resilience and adaptation with, with particular emphasis on the challenges faced by rural and marginalized communities cross-sector mitigation, which is looking at the, the different sectors of greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So transportation versus building heat versus agriculture versus electricity, et cetera. Uh, the Just Transition Subcommittee, uh, which is looking at how these policies would, would impact different communities uh, across the Vermont landscape. Uh, the Agriculture and Ecosystem Subcommittee, which I think of as the, the Carbon Sequestration Subcommittee, but looking at ways we can take advantage um, of the benefits provide, the myriad benefits provided by natural and working lands. Uh, and then we did create, end up creating a fifth subcommittee, um, which we've termed the Science and Data Subcommittee. Uh, and this subcommittee is looking both at the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, uh, which serves as the basis for all of our calculations, um, and is a, a, a piece of work that DEC has maintained for, for more than 10 years now, um, just to make sure it's actually the right tool for this Climate Council job. Um, and the Science and Data Subcommittee is also working on an, an overall carbon budget for the state of Vermont, uh, which will help, help us determine uh, our ability to meet that, that net zero by 2050 goal uh, that was established in the Global Warming Solutions Act. So Julie, may I ask you a question? Please. So if we're so curious, um, over the summer, we can go back and watch these meetings? You can. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a Climate Council website, and maybe Jane can, can help and, and paste a link to it in the chat uh, so that you will have I'll access. Send it to Lori. She'll give it to all of us. OK, fantastic. Um, but at all, not only the council meetings, but the steering committee meetings and the subcommittee meetings are all uh, recorded and made available through the website. So there, there's literally probably at this point hundreds of hours um, so of we'll, working. <laughs> the beachside novel and go right to. Correct. Right. <laughs> there, there, but and and there's a I mean a, to the extent the committee's interested, I can certainly flag some that I think would be a, a particular mm -hmm. interest. Um, but it, it, it's all out there. And, and we have had um, continuous public participation in all of the meetings, which is, is welcome. And I think a, a reflection of the interest that this work holds for the broader public. Thank you. Uh, so just a little bit more on the, the subcommittees. Generally, they have eight to 10 members. That was sort of our, our rule of thumb. Um, and it includes a mix of both council members, but we were also given the authority to appoint 
uh, members that, that aren't part of the council and tried to use that opportunity to make sure we had the, the full breadth of expertise uh, that would support the work of the subcommittees, as well as trying to, to improve upon um, geographic um, balance, as well as some other issues around diversity. Each of the subcommittees is being supported um, by some state of Vermont agency staff. Um, and then we've had counselors who volunteered to serve as liaisons between subcommittees where necessary, because there's certainly places where the work uh, of the different subcommittees uh, meets, intersects, or could overlap or, or underlap. And one good example might be thinking about the role that natural and working lands can play in carbon sequestration, um, but are also a really important tool for thinking about landscape level resilience. And so just making sure um, both that we don't have two people doing work in the same space or uh, worse, probably having no one doing work in that space because they assume it's within somebody else's purview. Uh, each subcommittee has two co-chairs, one from the executive branch and one that was legislatively appointed. Um, and each of the counselors indicated what subcommittee they were interested in serving on and generally received their first or second choice. And we were able to sort of make this the, these assignments. Uh, this is just to give you a, a quick sense. And this is obviously in the slide deck we've sent to Lori so you can take a, a little bit closer look at it. Um, but gives you the, the membership of, of each of the committees. So you can see um, both the counselors as well as the members of the public to know who is serving where. Um, in terms of the, the subcommittee work, most of these subcommittees are, are now to the point of meeting weekly. They've all drafted a charter and then we went back and matched them up against each other to make sure there isn't overlap or underlap. Um, the subcommittees have established a work plan and timeline for their work and most recently have engaged with our uh, public outreach contractor, which is Climate Action, to begin planning how they will bring the public uh, into their work early on. Um, the all of this is building towards the Climate Action Plan, which as I noted before, needs to identify those specific initiatives, programs, and strategies. Um, and we have developed sort of a, a sequence for that work. It includes inventorying existing programs, then looking at what else we need to do to actually achieve the targets of the act, uh, thinking about how we're gonna pay for all of this, developing a strategy to monitor uh, our progress and make sure that, that we are making both cost-effective investments and that they're having the desired impact um, the Climate Action Plan needs to identify rules or necessary legislation that will be required to support implementation. Um, and we are, are barreling towards the adoption date of, of December 1st of this year, but recognizing um, that this is really a, a preliminary action plan. Um, it's gonna be heavily focused on the, the 2025 greenhouse gas emission reduction target that was established in the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, but there's an, an ongoing commitment and in fact requirement to update the plan at least every four years thereafter um, as we continue to, to build on this work. Just laying out uh, what we see is, is taking place between where we sit today um, and, and December of this year uh, is a, a lot of technical analysis. Um, pathways and scenarios are the, the different approaches that would allow us to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirements. Um, that review of the greenhouse gas emissions inventory I described as well as a carbon budget. Um, ultimately, once we have pathways and scenarios that we believe are technically feasible, we need to think about the costs of them and ensure that, that those are also feasible, um, as well as building an, a monitoring and assessment framework um, so that we know upfront how we plan to, to track and measure our progress. Um, all of this is done with a, a um, a constant theme of public engagement throughout. Uh, we know that, that a lot of the work that's gonna be required to achieve our greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals, whether it's in the transportation sector or the building heat sector, is really gonna require uh, changes in individual behavior. And so it's essential uh, that we get broad buy-in from the public as we are beginning this work. Um, and so I've placed a great deal of emphasis on that, both the, the um, public comment and public involvement in the meetings, but also um, having brought on board a contractor to specifically help us flesh out a public outreach and engagement strategy. Um, 
And you know, that's a nice segue in that we actually have three contractors supporting the, the work of the Climate Council. Uh, we hired the Consensus Building Institute back this earlier this winter uh, to provide facilitation and process support. Um, they have been a, a great addition and, and frankly have been involved in, in climate action work in both uh, New York and in Maine. And so I've been able to also help share some of their, their gained experience and expertise um, in those efforts to inform our work. Uh, we've recently contracted with Climate Action and RISE Consulting to support uh, public engagement and outreach process. Um, and then we are in the final throes of getting a, a technical contractor underway. Uh, we actually started with a request for information back in early January, um, just trying to, to, know, to see if we could get some advice on what, what we know and what we don't know. Uh, we received 15 responses, hundreds of pages. It was incredibly instructive um, and, and really informed the RFP that we then released on April 14th. Um, that those proposals were due back to us in early May. Uh, we received four responses and hope to have a contract in place by, by June 1st. And this is going to cover several different areas of, of technical support, uh, emissions modeling, economic modeling, and then helping us think through the, the monitoring and program evaluation components. And I do have a couple extra slides at the end, but maybe pause there. Um, is a great place to, to start a, a conversation. And the other pieces just are the, the overall budget um, for the development of the Climate Action Plan, uh, as well as a, a little bit of information on the, the proposals the governor advanced in terms of the America Rescue Plan funding related to climate action. Thank you, Secretary. This is so informative. You know, when people, when we leave, you know, we think we do great work here. Sometimes we, we try to and work in conjunction. So we're looking, really looking forward to the, the work that comes out of this. And it's a great segue for us to end our session and going forward. I see Representative Shaw, your hand is up. Oh, good, Representative Burke, welcome. I was worried. <laughs> and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for Julie, I guess, uh, good morning again. Uh, early in your presentation, you showed up some slides that talked about uh, uh, your rural uh, resilient uh, subcommittee and talking about marginal communities. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what defines a marginal com community uh, and I'm hoping economic, economically disadvantaged communities are in that list. I will actually uh, turn it over to, to Jane uh, because I have not been participating in that particular subcommittee, but do know that's been a topic of considerable conversation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Shaw. So um, excitingly, um, the first body of work that's coming out of one of the subcommittees um, is actually contains the definition of just that um, and the Just Transition Subcommittee is putting forward a package for review and consumption by the other subcommittees and the council on Monday that will include the set of guiding principles, which will be the underpinning to inform the strategies and recommendations that come out of the subcommittees. And included in that is also a definition of impacted um, communities is the, is the term that they've settled on um, that encapsulates um, marginalized communities and speaks to just, as you say, economic disparity, uh, geographic disparity, um, BIPOC communities, um, impacted frontline communities, um, and communities that face the brunt of mo most of the climate change impacts and um, will need to be considered for adaptation. Um, and the final suite in that package includes a set of questions that take the guiding principles, which are very high level, and make them actionable for subcommittees to consider as they um, think about strategies and recommendations development. They're the first series in what will likely become the equity impact assessment to consider as, on the back end of policy recommendations and strategies. Great, I'm glad to, glad to hear that, how broad that, that charge is going to be. And quite often down, down my way, and, and I know maybe up in the Northeast Kingdom, the economic um, vitality of many of our communities is, is very poor. And uh, so I appreciate you uh, considering that factor uh, when, when we're looking at that, because those are the communities that are going to need probably more help than the, the larger communities. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Oh, Representative Burke, I hear that your internet is a little sketchy this morning. I'm sorry. Yeah, and not only that, but I completely spaced out this this meeting until I put the text. Yeah, to John. I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. So I have worry. to go back and watch. YouTube is Thank terrific you, Chair, for this. As a matter of fact, we're learning this morning that all of the council's meetings, it's going to become my summer go to watch to get caught up. Um, uh, you have no idea, Secretary and others, how how often during our legislative session that you know we've tried to, and I hope that you know within the work that we've done this year is an attempt to keep advancing uh, goals or, or you know activities for Vermont and Vermonters that that help us get to the next step, um, and that nothing that we've done, I believe, has interfered with with getting there and um, making some, some smaller steps this year and looking forward to really partnering next year with what, uh, what comes out for what we need to work on. So we'll look, we're gonna look forward to it and get, get after it. I see Representative White's hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as someone who missed yesterday's meeting, <laughs> I'm maybe feeling a little better about it. Uh, um, I just wanna thank, um, uh, Julie and Jane. And then I had a question that you actually were alluding to it, which is, I think that our committee has a real opportunity to work hand in hand with the recommendations that come out of this group. Um, and I'm wondering, as you look at the transportation bill that were, I don't know, the bow might not be fully on it yet, but like, Pretty close, right? Maybe this morning uh, we're gonna. Yeah. The, the bow will be glued this morning. <laughs> It'll be really stuck to that beautiful package. Uh, what your reflections would be on if we're kind of moving in the right direction, and I I think proactive is the word I would use, um, assuming that we'll be um, considering the same ways to tackle um, emissions reduction. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start and then would love for, for Jane or, or Joey to weigh in. Um, certainly the T-bill the contains a lot of really exciting investments and incentives around electric vehicles. And, and we know that that's going to be a central component of what we have to do to achieve our greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. I think the, the most recent report from, from the Energy Action Network suggests that we need um, north of 40,000 electric vehicles on the road by, by 2025, uh, which is a tenfold increase from where we sit right now. Uh, I would say my, my only um, concern or, or um, frankly reflection is uh, in addition to incentivizing electric vehicles, I think there's a lot of work to be done to incentivize uh, the construction of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, that that you know the many Vermonters will have the opportunity to to charge at home, um, but also need the ability to to charge on the road. Uh, I saw a little something from from Drive Electric Vermont, uh, where they showed a tool that the the federal one of the federal agencies had put together, and it suggests we're also only at about one fifth of the charging infrastructure we need, publicly available charging infrastructure we need to fully support. Uh, the fleet of electric vehicles we'd like to see on the road by 2025. So they're just, they're, there's an enormous amount of work that needs to take place in this space. Um, grateful to the committee for the emphasis uh, placed on electric vehicle incentives um, and, and look forward to continuing to work with you uh, to, to help reach those goals. I don't know, Jane or Joey, if there's anything you'd add there. Ooh, yeah. Go ahead, Joey. No, okay. Jane, do you have anything on that? No, thank you. OK. I see some hands have gone up, and I am going to look at my handy dandy participants so I can see it's Representative Stebbins, then Representative Burke, and then Representative Smith. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, Julie, nice to, nice to see you. Um, uh, and uh, full disclosure, uh, my firm is one of the, my, my other job, um, you know, June through December is one of the firms that um, has uh, submitted a proposal um, to do the Climate Council analysis. Um, but separate from that, what I wanted to ask 
with regards to your comment, Julie, about um, charging stations, what I think is really exciting, um, you know, I'm always looking for like the triple win is uh, the opportunity for um, growing uh, jobs here in Vermont related to those charging stations. Um, and I'm wondering how much um, I, I know a &R, you know, there, there's a reason why we have different agencies and different departments, um, because not everybody can do everything. But I wonder um, when you're thinking about charging stations and the need for those, um, how much interaction does a &R have with, um, you know, say, education or with ACCD so that we can start to connect those dots in terms of um, you know, for Vermonters who may have lost their job during the pandemic, you know, are there opportunities there to start training folks um, to be able to, um, you know, grow this new industry here in Vermont so we get both the climate, you know, the savings in terms of, you know, Vermonters not filling up their internal combustion vehicle, but then also, you know, Vermonters actually getting jobs from this. And I wonder how much you've looked into that. And then I have one other question for you. Sure. Uh, so we do have an interagency coordinating committee, particularly around electric. Well, we have many interagency coordinating committees, but there is one specific to electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, maybe less of an emphasis on, on sort of the, the job creation component and more an emphasis on how we sort of balance um, making sure we have a good distribution of these things to address what we know to be um, the public's concerns about range anxiety as well as thinking about how we can use these, frankly, as a, a tool to, to drive uh, visitors into our, our downtowns and village centers where they hopefully take the, the time while their car charges uh, to get out, walk around, grab a sandwich and, and, and enjoy some of our, our communities. Um, and so there's a team that includes representatives from, from ANR, from ACCD um, and, and from VTRANS among others, along with the public service department because we also need uh, different types of power, depending on what kind of station we're putting in, um, to make sure that we've considered all of the, those aspects and attributes. Um, that was a group that formed around the VW mitigation settlement monies we received, where we dedicated a significant portion of those dollars to electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, I think we've been really successful in the way that those, those charging stations have been placed on the landscape um, and look forward to continuing that process. Um, in terms of the, the specific workforce development components, um, one of the things that we think is really important from a workforce perspective is being able to show a multi-year commitment to some of these different initiatives. Uh, a, a key piece of feedback we heard um, in regards to weatherization, which is another important component of our overall climate action work from the community action agencies was they wanna see multi-year commitments, that it was one of the greatest challenges they saw with the ARA funding back in 2008, 2009, was there was this enormous surge in money for weatherization, followed by an equally enormous uh, curtailment of the dollars available as opposed to um, a sustained commitment. Um, and that's one of the things that, that went into how we thought about the ARPA dollars and frankly, how we will think about um, the recommendations we bring forward uh, for any future federal infrastructure package is trying to demonstrate sustained commitment in these areas, which I think inspires businesses uh, to build the workforce. They actually need to take advantage of those resources. Yeah, thanks. Well, so consider this my personal plug that um, when there are those interagency meetings, um, perhaps, perhaps there starts to be um, some discussion about, um, you know, connecting with um, continuing, uh, you know, technical education training facilities and, and um, agency of education. Um, and I just wanted to put out a flag there. I, I have completely understood the um, rationale of, okay, we're going to have an EVSE within a certain distance of every highway. Um, I'll just throw out there that uh, one of the things that has been discussed in this committee a few times is when you look at the drive electric map, um, you know, there are certain places that just don't have very many spots. And, um, you know, it was really interesting to hear uh, Representative McCoy. I mean, clearly she knew exactly like the four spots in her area that would make sense because she drives it so often. And um, so just to think, you know, with that interagency or, or even Representative Smith and, and, you know, up in the Northeast Kingdom, where if it, 
understanding that the data analytic viewpoint of like, we should be a certain distance from a highway. Um, if we don't have highways, uh, we might need to be a little bit more creative and ask the folks who actually live those roads all the time, um, you know, where are the key spots, which I'm sure, you know, Agency of Transportation also knows, but um, I have other questions, but other people do too, so I will stop. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. And I know we have Joey Miller and others as well, Jane, so. Yeah. So thank you. This is actually very helpful because even in the negotiations in the uh, uh, conference of committee on, on the T bill, there was some discussion around, and I had a had a position where you know there's a lot of people who look with consultants and to figure out where we should be placing these, where it makes sense, and sometimes our willy I don't want to say willy nilly approach to it, but but there's a there's a middle ground of that taking you know that kind of on the ground plus the the uh, analytical piece for placement. And we're starting to get there, Representative Burke and then Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam okay. Speaker. Uh, thank you to all our guests. Thank you for the work you're doing on the Climate Council. Uh, and I apologize for my late entry. Um, I A couple of things thinking about resources to make this transformation. You know, certainly, hopefully we'll find in the infrastructure bill that's hopefully coming out of Congress. And also I wonder, and maybe you talked about this before, whether there's been any discussion in the council about the um, alignment with the potential uh, revenues from the uh, Transportation Climate Initiative. We, we haven't discussed that yet. We haven't sort of gotten to that that place in our, our process where we're looking at how we would finance the strategies. We're still very much in the stage of, of developing alternatives that would allow us to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals, um, thinking about the cost of those alternatives, and then we will turn our attention ultimately to how to pay for them. It just seems like there are a couple of possibilities hanging out there with that and infrastructure bill. And I, I have to say that it just seems to me that this electrification is really starting to, <laughs> using a transportation metaphor, accelerate. And uh, with the, the, the Ford 150, seeing yeah. the, the news about that is just, you know, and thinking about how our money for the, for the um, incentives has already been used up for this, for this fiscal year. And they're, of course, doing some bridge funding, but uh, it just, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's a really exciting time to be on this committee and hoping that we can work with you as we as we move forward with, with our goals. Thank you. You're welcome. I did see that piece on the F-150 last night. It was very exciting. And some of the data that that is the vehicle that sells annually $43 billion a year is spent on an F-150, just that one vehicle. And now it's, if it goes lightning, it's very interesting as well. Representative. Just one more thing. I just wanted to add one more thing because they had the woman on who's the engineer for that. And she had been working at Ford since she was 19 years old. She's now in her forties and she is the engineer. I mean, she's driving this truck, pulling this huge, heavy, you know, doing all the test driving. It was pretty. A million pretty cool. pounds. It pulled a million pounds. That was a great segment. Thanks representative. Representative Smith, please go ahead. We'll try to contain our excitement. We'll just. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, thank you for letting me speak. That's what I meant. Uh, Secretary Moore, or anyone, any one of you can answer this question, maybe. Uh, with these big goals of creating these charging stations and more electric cars in Vermont, how are these charging stations going to put electricity in these cars? Are they going to be diesel fired generators or strictly wind and water? Uh, they, they will be connected to the grid. And so to the extent uh, that our grid is, is green and low carbon, uh, the charging stations themselves, the energy provided by the charging stations themselves will also be. So there will, nothing's going to be generated from diesel or fossil fuels? No. Wonderful. Glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank well, you. Well, at least in Vermont. We can't, we, we can't say for the rest of the country. <laughs> yes. So, do you have a you have agreements with uh, Hydro Quebec that we get a lot much power from them? 
We do. The, uh, I would have to defer to the Department of Public Service to be able to speak in detail, but certainly we, we have uh, a number of the utilities have long term agreements with with Hydro Quebec, as well as with Great River Hydro that manages the, the set of dams on the Connecticut River. Great. Thank you. You're welcome, member. Thank you for your patience. Committee, anybody else? So um, I don't know if it would be helpful, but I Jane could speak a little bit just to what what our summer looks like. Oh, that um, would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> no, please go ahead. I'd be happy to. And um, I was also going to add just um, in follow up to Representative Smith's um, comment about electrification is just that obviously the comprehensive energy plan is also being undertaken right now. Um, and I just wanted to highlight um, how closely um, we're coordinating with the public service department around the, the comprehensive energy plan with many of their staff um, serving on the climate council subcommittees, um, as well as Commissioner Tierney herself on the climate council. We're meeting regularly. And in fact, um, right after this meeting, we're meeting with Joey and others to consider um, coordination around our engagement components of both the comprehensive energy plan and the climate action plan. So I think that it's really well timed um, and it won't always be like that. The comprehensive energy plan is updated every six years. So we'll come into alignment every 12 years on the two comprehensive planning processes. But it's really nice to be out of the gate on this first one in coordination with um, the public service department. So for this summer, um, we are, um, there, there's a lot of work to be done. It's hard to imagine a summer vacation for many folks on um, the Climate Council or the subcommittees, but we're on track. Um, we are um, embarking on phase one of our public engagement um, right now. That includes um, the development of the public engagement plan by the end of June, as well as um, to inform that component, um, the audience analysis, which will include interviews, as well as um, a discrete number of roundtables around key um, allies and partners in the work, as well as a roundtable um, primarily focused on uh, BIPOC members of our community and uh, um, organizations that represent BIPOC members of our community. So that will be done in June um, to inform and be distributed and synthesized to the subcommittees to inform their strategies and recommendations that are due to be teed up as a complete package at the beginning of July. Um, that will not have been informed at that point by the technical analysis, which will come towards the end of the summer. Um, around that the sectors analysis, pathways analysis, um, around the four main components of the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee, which include transportation, um, buildings, electricity, thermal, and um, non-energy emissions, which the largest bulk of that non-energy is agriculture. Um, so um, throughout the summer, we'll be continuing along the way with the, that technical analysis in close uh, concert with the uh, technical consultants at the same time doing the public engagement around those draft strategies and recommendations. Um, it'll mean for a busy fall when we come back in September and, and attempt to um, put together the complete climate action plan throughout the fall, which will then include the analysis around the economic components. So um, trying to understand um, what each um, policy and strategy will cost and mean on the ground for Vermonters. Um, as well as including the comments and thoughts from the public over the summer on the strategies and recommendations um, and further um, in line with the technical analysis, which will be wrapping up um, in the fall. Um, so we're on target um, and to put together the comprehensive climate action plan for the December 1st deliverable, recognizing that there'll be ongoing public engagement to follow around that plan um, come next winter. Um, but our intent will be to move into rulemaking um, in the winter, as well as consider those no regrets must have policies um, with the legislature as you reconvene um, next year. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, and just um, as far as the technical analysis component, um, which we've alluded to, that's the final big contract to, for us to get um, in place. Um, and that RFP closed last week, and we had four excellent proposals, all of which any of them could do the job. And we're moving forward with a contract um, as we speak. And so we hope by the first June 1st that we'll have that work in place um, to coordinate closely with all the subcommittees, but in particular cross-sector mitigation. That'll be looking at um, mitigation strategies. 
Thank you. Definitely wets our whistle about what's coming and very exciting. It's a great way to sort of end our official testimony for the for the session. I see what one more hand, Representative uh, Stebbins, please go ahead. Thanks, Chair. And I um uh, to to Julie and Jane, uh, thank you both so much. I'm just I'm feeling badly because we asked Joey Miller to speak, and I'm just uh, Joey. You know, you're sort of one of the many volunteers giving your time. I, I'd, if you, I'd love to hear what your experience is, what what you're seeing, what your role is. I will be brief. I know you have to go. Thanks. Um, Representative Stebbins, and thanks for the opportunity to join you here this morning. You got the very um, high level um, overview from Secretary Moore and Jane, um, but just so you know, in case it's ever helpful, um, a little bit more about the structure. I'm the house appointed member representing the environmental community, which is a big task considering the environmental community is not monolithic, but my organization, the Vermont uh, Natural Resources Council, we do a lot of work in coalitions. so. We are connected to a lot of Vermonters in that way. Um, and another role that we play is helping to coordinate the Transportation for Vermonters network, um, which is a network of a lot of different partners. Um, as you are well aware, this is my first opportunity to, to be with you all. So I appreciate the time. And I also just wanna say thank you for all your work on the transportation bill. Um, I, I have been following that and really appreciating um, all you have done, and I do hope you tie it up with a bow today, but I think some of the programs that you have um, expanded on there, as we've been talking about, and or created, like the Replace Your Ride program, are the very things that um, we are going to be looking at um, to further partner with you on and to you know do more work on as, um, as a state. And just so you know, when it comes, Jane Jane articulated it on the cross-sector cross mitigation subcommittee, I'm taking the lead on the transportation work, um, building off a lot of the work um, that has been done to date and really trying to inform that work by following what you what you are all doing, but also working with and um, connecting with our regional planning commissions. Um, Representative Smith, when you were asking your question, I, I just, I, I was thinking, you know, we have so much work um, that we have done and our RPCs are really, really important partners in this endeavor. So working with a lot of different folks there. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're deep in the work. We've had several conversations with these informal um, networks of experts and practitioners. And we've begun talking about some of the different strategies that are not surprising to you, like electrific electrification and um, reduction of vehicle miles traveled, higher efficiency vehicles, um, doing what you've done, like expanding transit, bike and pedestrian facilities, telecommuting. Those are the initial conversations. The Transportation and Climate Initiative has come up in our um, sort of many different conversations, but as Secretary Mo Moore alluded to, um, this is in the process of you know early conversations, baking, baking this, um, and we're looking forward to going out to the to the public for further input um, and building off the work that we have done to date on the comprehensive energy plans, um, uh, historic climate council work, including the governor's climate action commission. I was a member of that commission and, and helped lead the transportation work there as well. So we got a foundation upon which to build and a lot of work to do as you heard from secretary Moore and Jane. Um, and that really critical component is gonna be informed by the public as that really ramps up. So. I just appreciate the opportunity, um, Representative Stebbins, just to give you a high level overview. Thank you for the work that you've done. Um, and I personally am looking forward to continuing to work with you all in the legislature and um, in this process to, to, to make progress in a really thoughtful, equitable way. So thanks. You're welcome. I see another hand is up, Representative White. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a bit of a, a can of worms as we get closer to the end of this meeting, but um, so TCI and it's coming down the road, we can see it, um, hopefully. Uh, what role do you think that the Climate Council will play when it comes to TCI and recommendations, knowing that that's maybe behind the curtain? Um, and do you have updates for us as a committee that would be relevant as we go into the summer? 
So as I assume you know, uh, the administrations continued to participate in the, the TCI conversations. There were just three states, I think, that agreed to sign on initially, but an, another group that's sort of in that second tier. Um, and that's where Vermont sits. Uh, Commissioner Walk from the Department of Environmental Conservation has, has been sort of our, our lead in that space um, and is continuing to, to participate in, in the meetings around TCI. Um, I think it, it, you know, that that is a, a funding tool that's out there, and, and we recognize that. And in some ways, we need to sort of wait till we build up our strategies to see if it if it matches and that makes the most sense. Um, but absolutely, are are continuing to pay close attention to the the rollout of that program, um, and have have been involved in the conversations about how it's structured. So, to the extent Vermont does um, choose to move forward in that space, uh, that 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 it's sort of built in a way that um, will, will facilitate that. And I know that that's really the, the big thinking that's gone into the way um, Massachusetts and the other states have continued to convene these conversations to ensure that that next tier um, not only has the opportunity, but they, they've created a structure that would actually support participation by a, a broader coalition of states. So uh, work continues on that, I would say at this point in parallel, um, but ultimately the, the climate action plan will, will bring those two together as we need to look at how, how we're gonna pay for the work um, that's identified as being required. Thank you. What? I too have, oh, I'm sorry, I've been, I'm sorry, Representative White, were you finished? No, I, th I think um, Johanna Miller might have had a response oh, as well. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I thought I heard well, just One thing I would add to that is just in the transportation conversations we've been having is also looking at models that other states are mm -hmm. advancing that are complementary to TCI, like Massachusetts. There is a bill that's been introduced, I think, to, um, in both chambers that really, you know, because states have agency over how to direct those dollars, um, that really takes it one step further than the MOU and, and directs, like, for example, the Massachusetts bills, I believe, have 70% of the revenues going to um, mar marginalized communities, more low-income communities. And for, I'm, I'm, I raise that here for you because if TCI does move forward, um, Vermont could have the ability to you know, shape where those dollars go and to direct them to more rural places or to places with who carry a greater energy burden. So we're following that. I just wanted to highlight that for you. It's good. I see I've been following, you know, the TCI conversation was great. It rem reminds me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I see it as sort of like where we taxed tobacco. Um, we, But you would not want to build your foundation of how you're going to fund going into the future on something that's going to, you hope, the taxing of it is actually going to cause it to diminish is its goal, is one of its goals. But in the meantime, it's, it has some benefits for, for what you could do with, with, um, with, with those revenues. Plus the goal is to, to get the behavior to change. So the bigger conversation behind that is going to be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it, it's gonna take at this rate watching the electrification happening five, maybe eight years from now, we're really gonna have to flip the coin on the funding of how transportation is funded. And there will be no time like maybe in two or three years from now, two years from now that we start to lay the groundwork on the seeds of how and what that's gonna possibly look. And maybe something will come up in the new FAST Act um, of some of ideas around where we're going to go and how long it'll take to get there. But I, it'll, it'll be that continued conversation is the next place. I see Representative Stebbins, is that your hand is up? Sorry. Yes. And then Thank I you. think we'll wrap it up because we're going to the floor at 10 and I, I'm, I need to be down there, but you guys can stay. <laughs> um, thanks, Madam Chair. I was just going to say what I, um, what I think is neat about TCI is that it's, um, you know, to your point, Madam Chair, if, if you tax something, it doesn't necessarily change behavior. I mean, if someone's, if someone's addicted to smoking, they're going to keep smoking. Um, even if, you know, until you make that pain point, that tax so uh -huh. painful that yeah. they just can't afford it. And I think that's one of the things about TCI that's really interesting is that it's not just a tax, it's, it's a cap. It's saying, we have, this, we have this requirement that you can't go past um, and, and that you, you have to 
So, and, and then if you go past it, you take the money and you reinvest it in wherever we want it to be reinvested. Um, so I'll be, I'll be really interested to like follow whatever happens with those Massachusetts bills. Cause I think, I think it's important to really say TCI is not a carbon tax. It, it, it has another, it has another policy tool to it that says, this is, how, this is as far as you can go. And that cap piece is really critical. But what I was really gonna say was, I heard some concerns that like, for people who live along the border, um, that, you know, Vermonters might be getting dinged by not participating in TCI because it increases like, it, it increases the cost, but we're not getting the benefits. Right. Joey, if you've been following this, does, is that making sense or, or Jane or yes. Julie or? Um, I will just be quick. I know you have to peel. I, I don't think those that has been calculated yet. I mean, I think you can, so. But that'd be great. I heard concerns and I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, how, you know, are, are we, yeah, are we seeing an impact? And I know it's 955, but I don't I'm also going to see it just yet. But there was the from what I can add to that conversations in the in the past, even before they went to their next step when the states were looking at it. Companies are not going to just charge New York different than Vermont, different from New Hampshire. They're going to charge. So if if the states around us, it'll come to like, when is there a critical point? If New Hampshire and, and New York are in it, well, they're not gonna, oh, Vermont doesn't have this. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna get charged the same and we won't have the benefit, but it, we haven't, I don't think we've gotten there yet. No, and, and in this, right now we're in this, this sort of startup phase where it's really kind of monitoring sales and looking at what the, the set point needs to be. Uh, the the TCI um, charge isn't in effect at this point yeah. in any state. So you can't monitor the reaction. Correct. This is all good. This is really, really good. And um, and I'm sure that many you know members will be paying attention as much as we can. And that sort of wanes. Life will get very busy in September. We'll go, what? There was something really good happening, which is like what happened this year. We knew you were out there working and doing great work. We we just um, were in our lane doing this work. And, and I appreciate you coming in today to be able to give us that update and a hint at what's coming and what we should pay attention to over the summer and fall in this area of change. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, encourage any of you to join us for any of our, our council meetings um, and, and oh, see yeah. the, the council itself at work. We meet generally the fourth Monday of the month, the morning of the fourth Monday of the month. Um, and our, our next meeting is scheduled for May 24th. Um, so I'll, always welcome people to, to join us and participate and would welcome the opportunity to come back uh, next winter when you reconvene and share further updates as to the work of the council. We look forward to it. Thank you for coming. Have a good afternoon and thank you. Thank you. it's going to be a great day. Thanks, everyone. Good luck with the bow. Bye now. Bye bye. So committee, we're going to we're going to go to the floor now and I message from the, the speaker that um, we're going to take up our T-bill conference committee this morning. So I hope I'm ready. A little nervous, but you know, um, I'll try to do my best. And we are meeting as a committee tomorrow morning. Tomorrow at 930. Everybody huddle. It's going to be our last huddle. I'm calling it the, the family huddle. Okay.